unboxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Well, as expected, Showtime has rolled out their upcoming lineup for the next couple of weeks, next couple of months, and the sport of boxing. And I told you not to speak too soon in reference to the recent decline in Showtime's viewership. Don't count them out just yet because there are a number of solid matchups en route that could turn the tide for Stefan Espinoza and their boxing programming. Oh. Luis Neary versus Brendan Figueroa is a solid matchup. I've said that before and I'll say it here again. That's set to go down on May 15th. May 29th, after that, Nordin Ubali versus Nonito Donaire is set to go down. Yet another solid matchup. It's not a foregone conclusion that Nordin can beat Nonito because he hasn't competed at the level of Nonito for as long as Nonito has competed. And if the Nonito Donaire that fought Naoya Inoue in the World Boxing Super Series Final. If that's the version of Nonito that shows up, Nordinu Bali is in for a long night. We then come to a more ho hum blase matchup between the very outspoken Jermal Charlo against the very unheralded Juan Montiel. I told you guys that's what was coming. Remember? This is the guy that knocked out a very past it James Kirkland that shouldn't have even been allowed to fight, but you know, here we are. For all the talk, all the discussions in reference to Jermall Charlo that have happened the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months, yeah. the Canelo stuff, yeah. the Benavidez stuff, yeah. this is who he's fighting. And if I'm being honest, given who Jose Benavidez is going to be in action against in late August, Bolivita. that Charlo versus Benavidez fight could have happened. It could have and should have been made, but it wasn't. Surprise. Charlo versus Montiel is set to go down in June. Fuck that fight. Late June, Javante Davis makes his next ring appearance on pay-per-view to fight Mario Barrios, and we all knew this was coming. This is a very strategic move, and we're gonna talk about why that is a little later on in the video. As far as the matchup itself, I can tell you that it's not pay-per-view worthy. It shouldn't cost anybody 60 or $80 to watch Javante fight this guy. Who is that guy? I'll tell you. Javante Davis trying his luck at 140 pounds against Mario Barrios, an unbeaten fighter. It's actually a solid matchup. It's decent. Not the best, but certainly not the worst. We've seen Javante in there with worse guys than this. It's just that you shouldn't charge the boxing fans 60 to $80 every time Javante decides to fight a, a halfway decent fighter. Come on. This is not a fight that anybody was asking for. This is not a fight that, that very many, if any, boxing fans are actually looking forward to. You know, Javante Davis used to say that he was going to go to 140 pounds to challenge Josh Taylor. He goes up there, he challenges this guy. <laughs> Do I think that Javante Davis is going to challenge the winner of Taylor versus Ramirez? No. Fuck no. You got Chris Colbert in there with Yuriorkis Gamboa, early July, July the 3rd. Look, people are tired of seeing fucking Yuriorkis Gamboa, I'm sorry. Oh. I don't want to be an asshole, but I mean, seriously, I'm supposed to get excited that Chris Colbert is fighting Yuriorkis Gamboa in a division that's teeming with excellent fighters, excellent fights? You know, if it were like Chris Colbert versus Richard Comey or someone like that, well, then I could muster up some interest, but I'm honestly not interested in seeing Chris Colbert versus Yuriorkis Gamboa. Now, a fight that I'm very much enthusiastic about, the Jermel Charlo versus Brian Castaño undisputed junior middleweight title fight, what I view as the crowned jewel of this lineup. This fight is excellent. This fight is boxing at its best for a lot of reasons. It is the best versus the best. The very best guys at 154 pounds, they're not wasting their time. They're not pussyfooting around. They're not beating around the bush. They're going to get right to it to see who is the best of the best, the best of the rest. I got a lot of thoughts on that fight. We're going to get into those thoughts as the fight date approaches. But it does appear that the stories, the rumors, the rumblings we've been seeing the last couple of days in reference to this fight, it does appear that they've checked out because they are fighting in July. Oh. And the best part is it's not even a pay-per-view. Yeah. We'll talk about why that is, you know, but, but ultimately it is good news that you don't have to pay an arm and a leg to see a fight like this, yeah. a fight of this caliber. Yeah, that's good news. That's cause for celebration. We then have what can only be described as the last gasp of Guillermo Rigondeau versus the reigning WBO champion John Real Casamero at uh, 118 pounds. It is an intriguing fight, make no mistake. It is a fight worth watching. 
It's not tantamount to making a unification match with Naoya Inoue, but this fight does have its own kind of intrigue. Does Rigo have what it takes? Does he still have what it takes to take on someone like John Riel Casamero? Is this the PBC's way, Al Heyman's way, of, of you know, providing Rigo with some recompense for having blocked that Leo Santa Cruz fight all those years ago? Well, it's only recompense if Rigo wins, and that's the thing. We don't know that he will. We don't know that he won't. Is he trying to make things right with Rigo? Well, he might be. And if Rigo, by some lucky dog chance, becomes the WBO champion at this weight, if he beats John Riel Casemiro, I think that Al Heyman will have done just that because for all Rigo's talk of monster hunting, it doesn't seem like anybody on his side hit the gas with WBA in order to get a title shot with, you know, Naoya Inoue. Uh. This title shot is coming by way of the PBC, Al Heyman, and their island policy, two guys that are on that side of the street. And it is an intriguing matchup. Rigo is very old. So you really have to wonder what kind of chances he actually stands of, of beating John Real Casamero. We'll talk about that a little more as the fight date approaches on August 28th, 29th, I think. David Benavidez versus Jose Uskateki. Not a very intriguing matchup. And this goes back to what I said about Jermo Cholo, that, you know, Benavidez versus Cholo would have been a mouth-watering fight, pay-per-view worthy, even. But, you know, we know that Charlo has a wavering commitment to that fight, and we've talked about that extensively here on the channel. Now, Stefan Fulton versus the winner of Neri Figueroa, which will be a unification match regardless of who wins, whether it's Luis Neri, the reigning WBC champion, or Brandon Figueroa. You know, regardless of who wins, Stefan Fulton is going to see the winner of that fight. And I like this. I talked about this eventuality. I talked about this scenario that even though Brendan Figueroa is the WBA's regular champion, and he could use that regular title as a segue to challenge MJ Akhmedalia for the full title, MJ, who's the only unified champion at this weight, even though he could do that, he won't. He'll likely, you know, fight Luis Neri, which I'm okay with because it is for a full title after all. And the winner of that fight will unify with Stefan Fulton. And, and I'm okay with this sequence of events. I honestly am. It's what happens after that that concerns me. Once that's out the way, will the winner challenge MJ Akhmedaliev? Will we see an undisputed champion in the super bantamweight division in this lifetime? MJ is the man to beat. He's the unified champion. And, you know, that's what I want to see. But there's no telling if once all the smoke settles, that's what's going to happen. For all I know, maybe the winner of this sequence of fights takes on Danny Roma oh. instead of MJ Akhmedaliev. That could happen. Now it's time for the bigger picture stuff. There are a few particulars, a few details here that you want to pay attention to because they'll let you know what to expect. For starters, you look over at that Javante Davis versus Mario Barrios fight and you ask yourself, why the fuck are they doing this? Why? Well, we know that Javante Davis has struggled to make super featherweight, and even lightweight to a degree, over the years, seems like they're fast-tracking him to 140 pounds. Now, why would they want to do that? Well, there's an undisputed title fight set to go down there very soon between Jose Ramirez and Josh Taylor. I'm sure you're all aware. The thing is, I don't think Javante Davis is going to fight the winner of that fight, and what I think they're doing is positioning him to pick up a newly vacated title once the winner of that fight moves up to fight Terrence Crawford. That's right. I, I don't think they're putting him up there to fight the winner of that fight. I think they're sending him up there so that he doesn't have to struggle to make 130 or 135 anymore, and, and this will more or less allow him to become a two-division champion. Two divisions, because he was never actually a full champion at 135. He's held two world titles at 130, the IBF at first, then the WBA. They're sending him up there to 140 to fight for yet another WBA baby belt like the one he fought for at 135. And if they're doing this, I have no doubts, it's so that he doesn't have to cut down to 130 anymore, doesn't have to cut down to 135, oh. skips 135 altogether since the PBC don't have the hold over the lightweights that they have in some other divisions. They want him to be there at 140 pounds to pick up a vacant title. Maybe two, because once the winner of Taylor versus Ramirez, the might just... once the outcome of that fight is determined, the winner of that fight isn't going to stay there. They're likely going to move up. Right after. Vacate those titles. You'll also notice that Colbert versus Gamboa, it's actually a super featherweight contest. I thought it was a lightweight contest at first, but it's a super featherweight contest. I don't even know if Gamboa can make super featherweight healthy, but I don't think the people at the PBC are too hung up on that. Better still, 
It's a WBA super featherweight interim title fight. And what I think this is, is the PBC's way of positioning Chris Colbert to become the next WBA super featherweight champion so they can keep that title on their side of things, on their side of the street. Try and remember, Javante Davis is the super champion at 130 pounds. That belt, that's the belt that he won from Leo Santa Cruz. But his next fight is going to be at 140 pounds. It's conceivable that they're trying to time this just right so that once Javante vacates that version of the WBA title at 130, where this fight is taking place, Chris Colbert will already be in position to be elevated to full champion. They're trying to keep that belt on their side of the street. In the mean in between time, Javante, you know, he's going to be up there at 140, trying to maintain a position so that he can be elevated to WBA 140 pound champion. Makes sense. That's what I think is going on there. The PBC are moving their pieces on the board and putting them in a position to keep certain titles on their side of the street. They don't want those titles to stray away from PBC Island. That explains their affinity with WBA baby belts. So if you saw that Colbert versus Gamboa fight and thought to yourself that what that was going to result in was Colbert versus Davis, you're dead wrong. I don't think Javante Davis is going to be returning to either 130 pounds or 135 pounds in spite of the lightweight division being a hotter division than the super lightweight division. There's more money at 135 right now, but what the people over there at TMT and the PBC are banking on is all of those lightweights eventually moving up at some point to 140. Now, Davis versus Barrios being billed as a pay-per-view is absolutely fucking ridiculous because the best fight that that same division has to offer Taylor versus Ramirez isn't going to cost you an arm and a leg to watch. You're going to be able to see that on regular old ESPN. Is this fight that nobody was asking for It's likely going to run you 80 fucking dollars. Who in their right mind is going to pay that $80 is beyond me. And even here on this lineup, you know, Davis versus Barrios isn't anywhere near the best fight in Showtime's upcoming roster. Charlo versus Castaño fits that bill. Yet another undisputed title fight. That ain't going to cost you an arm and a leg to watch, so why the fuck would I pay $80 for Davis versus Barrios? I wouldn't. People over there at Showtime are working very hard to try and make Javante Davis a pay-per-view star, but this matchmaking isn't fooling anyone. And don't forget about his legal troubles. I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen with all that shit. And as we continue with the bigger picture stuff, the details, where the devil is, as we all know, the devil's in the details. That's where you gotta look for him. This is a good chunk of the PBC's stable right here. And you want to pay attention to what you don't see, who you don't see. You don't see Errol Spence Jr. You don't see Keith Thurman. Adrian Broner doesn't seem to have anything going on on any of these cards. Maybe this is what he was complaining about. Maybe he'll pop up on some other platform. Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> Errol Spence Jr. himself, the unified welterweight champion, took to Twitter and added that Fox needs to announce their lineup. And I've no doubts that Fox's lineup is not going to be as extensive as this. It's... Maybe going to feature, you know, Errol Spence Jr. versus Jordanis Ugas, the Ruiz versus Chris Ariola pay per view, maybe Keith Thurman's comeback fight. I don't know that Caleb Plant is going to try to squeeze in a fight between now and the fall, since he's already being tabbed to be Canelo Alvarez's next opponent after the Saunders fight. Does Caleb Plant want to get out there one more time to keep the tools sharp? Does he want to run risks with anybody? Is it even worth it? You know, who really knows? <laughs> Maybe Caleb Plant sits out the rest of the year. Maybe he has that Canelo fight. I'm not convinced that he's going to. I'm not convinced that Canelo Alvarez gets to unify the super middleweight division without making some kind of a commitment to the PBC because I think that's what they're looking for. I don't think they're going to sacrifice one of their unbeaten fighters to Canelo Alvarez. I don't think they're going to bend to his wishes. I think before it comes to that, if they can't lock him into something, they'll make the fight between Caleb and David. Bill it as a pay-per-view. And lest we forget... Deontay Wilder's return, if he is to return. I don't think he'll be returning on Showtime. I mean, you don't see anything involving Deontay Wilder here in Showtime's upcoming lineup, do you? And this lineup spans all the way from May into early September. No sign at all of Deontay Wilder when last we saw him. He was over there on Fox. And if he is going to come back, if he is going to have a comeback fight, a rebound fight, 
it'll likely be on Fox, where Andy Ruiz is set to be making his next ring appearance very soon. Though it is noteworthy that a good chunk of the PBC's stable is going to make their next ring appearances over there on Showtime. For a while now, it has been speculated, you know, people talk, yeah. people say things that you know, Fox ain't really all that happy with what's going on. They're not as invested. There have been rumors and rumblings, none that have been confirmed, by the way. They are just rumors that should be treated as such. But Fox has a wavering commitment to their PBC programming. They might be stepping out on the PBC. I don't know. Depending on how the next lineup goes and what kind of viewership that garners, we'll see. Right now... I guess what's supposed to be the biggest names that they got over there, Errol Spence Jr., who sold, I don't know, a little over 200,000 pay-per-view buys with Danny Garcia, and the disgraced former WBC champion, Deontay Wilder, who is not a world champion at all. And what kind of business can he drum up on pay-per-view? I mean, like I said, and I've been saying it, in order for Deontay Wilder to get maximum exposure in his next ring appearance, if he is to appear in the ring again, He'd be better off fighting on Free Fox, where everybody can see him, where everybody can watch it and everybody can talk about it, as opposed to catering to a limited audience on pay-per-view, where, you know, maybe they buy the fight, maybe they don't buy the fight. It all depends on who you're fighting. It all depends on what it costs. Ultimately, five out of the nine announced fights by way of Showtime are actually quality matchups, solid fights. Will they be enough to keep Showtime in the running? Will they be enough to allow Showtime to compete with Top Rank and ESPN, Matchroom, Golden Boy, and DAZN? Well, that's a numbers game. Only the viewership they gonna. Only the TV ratings will tell you that. But for what it's worth, many of these fights are solid fights.